This Week in Radio Tech. Episode 195 is brought to you by Telos and Axia. Together, enabling IP audio broadcast studios, talk shows, and audio connections almost anywhere. On the web at telosalliance.com. And now, our feature presentation. Twerd. What will happen to AM radio? And exactly what is radio these days anyway? Plus, we've got the reverse law of the internet. All right, calm down. He says that to everyone. This calls for immediate discussion. What's up, Dad? Yeah, yeah. All your days are belong to us. Yeah. From his palatial office of important business. Or in a choice hotel in a distant land. This is Kirk Harnack. Rob DeSantos covers trends and technology for Popular Communications Magazine. And he joins Chris Tobin and me. You're dialed in to This Week in Radio Tech. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted to be here. This is our second to last show for 2013. Sad to see 2013 go, but looking forward to 2014. This is episode number 195 of This Week in Radio Tech. It's the show where we talk about anything to do with radio technology and the things that radio touches. Communications of every description, uh, IP audio, you know, streaming, uh, getting audio back from remote sites, high-quality recording, uh, or just whatever quality you can get <laughs> recording and getting audio back from the field. We, have, we bring radio and broadcast engineers together and people from from other walks of life that, that touch the radio and technology industries we talk about it here on this show. So welcome in. Hey, our, uh, I'm Kirk Harnack. I'm the uh, you know, host of the show and uh, started this thing almost four years ago. My co-host with me this evening uh, online with us, well, he's in studio in, uh, in Queens, New York at the GFQ Studios. Ladies and gentlemen, the best dressed engineer in radio, it's Chris Tobin. Hey, Chris, welcome in. Hello, Kirk. I'm, yeah, I'm doing well. And uh, yeah, four years now, I think. That's it. It's been Just great. about. Almost, yeah. yeah. I like it. It's fun. And the new time and uh, next year will even be better. At least I think. Well, it'll, it'll be it'll be what working hours for us working stiffs, right? Yeah, but you know, it, <laughs> it gives me opportunities to maybe go on the road and go places and do stuff. Well, hey, it, here's our here's our commitment to to viewers and employers that are in time zones where we're on during business hours uh, next year. We will make sure that every show is not entirely filled with madcap hilarity. We'll make sure there's some actual teaching, like a webinar. This will be your weekly webinar, and you can learn all the stuff you got to learn. Uh, hey, if maybe we ought to deal, maybe we ought to do a deal where we, we instead of you know uh, continuing education points, which we probably couldn't really arrange for, we'll do some kind of bogus twerk, you know, education points. What do you think? Yeah, that works. I think so. <laughs> we'll get. We'll, you we know, have to set up a phone number and start to taking calls. Yeah, we, we ought to we ought to set something something up on the web page where people who view the show can click, can check in. I watched, and at the I don't know, at the end of the year, we'll send them something. That'd be kind of cool. And mm. we are planning on taking phone calls for the new year, right? Yes, that's right. That's in fact, Andrew. Let's um, let's talk about that next episode. Taking phone calls, uh, uh, and and how how you know there's different ways to do it. We'll talk about how we're going to do it. How about that? Perfect. I could tell you about what doesn't work well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Good deal. Good deal. Hey, a few minutes ago, if you're watching the show live, welcome in. Uh, you can watch on uh, gfqlive.tv, and that's the best place to catch it. You can choose from any number of streams there. You can also uh, download the audio version of the show later on. You can subscribe to the audio version uh, of the show. Just go to, uh, to gfqnetwork.net, um, uh, or you can go to thisweekinradiotech.com and see all the past episodes and, and download the audio or video there. So check it out. Uh, hey, I don't mean to, to uh, put off uh, this guy, but our guest this week is a fellow that I met at the Ohio Association of Broadcasters convention uh, a few months ago. Really fascinating guy, Rob DeSantos. Uh, he is a, uh, well, I... He writes trends in technology. I call him the thought leader at uh, at Popular Communications Magazine. Uh, Rob, welcome in. Uh, from where are you in Ohio? I'm in Columbus. Okay, good deal. You didn't have far to yeah, travel. I mean, for the I'm, I'm, I'm smack in the middle of. We actually warmed up today, so it's, I can't call it the frozen north. <laughs> well, I, hey, the company I work for is on is up there at the Mistake by the Lake, <laughs> known as Cleveland. And it's cold there. You guys don't yeah. get so much. Well, we, we hit fifty. We hit fifty today. Uh, told it's only going to last a couple of days, and now that we're <laughs> back to winter. 
Well, hey, uh, Rob is our guest, and we're going to cover a lot of subjects with him, uh, it, mostly in the realm of where's this going? Where is what is radio, and where's it going? And and what about AM? <laughs> Rob's gotten a lot of uh, a lot of communications back to him about about that subject. So, uh, uh, Popular Communications Magazine is the what he writes for, and he is the trends and technology uh, uh, column uh, writer for that magazine. Hey, our show is brought to you by uh, my employer. I sure appreciate their support. It's uh, Axia Audio. It's it's the Telos Alliance. And this week we're gonna we're gonna show you. This is gonna be cool. In uh, in about thirty minutes from now. We're going to show you a, an Axia studio under construction, and it is gorgeous. It is so cool. Actually, it's, it's two rooms. There's a, a control room and a talent room, and it's, it's, it's amazing. So stand by for that. All right. Uh, I'm, again, I'm Kirk Harnack along here with uh, uh, Chris Tobin and Rob DeSantos with uh, Popular Communications Magazine. Rob, I have seen Popular Communications Magazine on the shelves, and I, I'll tell you what, I, I may have picked one up one time and flipped through it, but I'm not a subscriber. Tell me, I guess I should know from the title, but what is this magazine all about? Uh, pretty much it covers the gamut of, of communications. Uh, monthly. There's monthly columns covering everything from ham radio, um, history of radio history, if you're, if you're into that, they have a column every month on uh, giving you bits and pieces, much like the kind of stuff you saw on Scott Firebush's website, uh, talking about the history of a station and what's going on. There's uh, columns in there about uh, propagation, a uh, column uh, about, uh, you know, the, the monitoring hobby, uh, folks into uh, using scanners and that sort of thing. There's, uh, uh, there'll be, might be a column on, uh, on, com on computers and, and, you know, communications. So, you know, wide wide range, uh, wide range of stuff. If it uh, if it if it has to do with uh, communications uh, from a you know from a popular standpoint, that's what that's where where they're at. So I, you guys, I mean, like 15 years ago, popular communications, I'm guessing, wasn't covering the internet very much. I mean, a number of us were on the internet 15 years ago, but I can't imagine that it, it was being covered a lot. Was no, it? Wasn't. It, uh, yeah. So, but that's changed now. Oh, I, I think I think that you know the reality is that that the internet revolution has pretty much touched everything. Um, you know, it's it's uh, you know there it would be you probably can't read a column in the magazine where in some way or another the internet is not mentioned. Whether it's send me stuff by email or it's you know here's this new great you know, application you can use to, you know, to collect or document this information or watch solar, you know, the solar cycle or whatever it is. I mean, it, it's, it's everywhere. It literally is everywhere. Mm, mm. So, yeah, I, I, how, you know, when I, th when I think of communications, uh, you know, I'm kind of an old school guy. I think of, uh, I think of radio. I think of shortwave. Oh, I think of the things that are um, mostly under the banner at Popular Communications Magazine. Uh, so AM, FM, and shortwave, uh, maybe, you know, police scanners, you know, that kind of thing, you know, short, short range communications that, that way. So uh, uh, let me just ask it a different way. How, how has the internet and all the communicating we do over that, like right now, uh, affected how, how big the magazine is or, or how much you're covering? What, what got pushed out of the way to, to cover internet communications? I, I, you know, I think, I think it's more an evolution than a revolution. I think what you see is you probably see less of the You'll see less of the headlines of, uh, you know, uh, monitor the highway patrol. Uh, <laughs> so there's lots of yeah. people still do that, um, yeah. and probably yeah. more of the, uh, you know, more stuff saying, you know, that might be, well, if you want to follow what's going on in in aviation, and while you're listening to your, you know, to the to the local tower, you can, you know, there's this, there's a. You know, you can bring up on the, on your computer, and you can watch all the flights going in and out of the airport in real time graphically. Yeah, uh, yeah. Plus so, your ATC from some other city, if you want. Right. Exa exactly. So it's so so the whole, you know, the whole business of of that has changed. I think the other thing that's changed is it's the internet's affecting the way we communicate, um, mm -hmm. not just what we talk about when we communicate it, it's really affecting the, the very fundamental way we communicate. And, and that, 
that comes to something I've written about, which I which I call the reverse law of the internet. Okay, the reverse and, law of the internet. All right. Yeah, and what and what I what I theorize is that the popularity, the number of times a message is read, the re, or if it's read at all, is inversely related to the length of the message. The longer the message, the less attention it gets. And the extreme example of that, of course, is Twitter. You know, 140 ah, characters, and yeah. the world is listening to you. Yeah. Whereas longer form communication has become far more narrow and more specialized, and and that's you know that's cha- that's simply changing the 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 whole dialogue in the communications area, you know, and, you know because because it affects so much of what we do as a society, let alone just as radio hobbyists or or professionals or engineers, because it because it is that pervasive. Yeah. Hey, Rob. This is Chris. Um, curious question. You know, popular communications magazine I've enjoyed for many years, and I still to this day pick it up and. Mm-hmm. And take a look, see. Uh, in your opinion, and what you've come across, and the stuff you guys do, what would you say? You know, what do you think? What is radio today? I mean, we're, you know, radio today to, to the average person, the industry, uh, folks like yourself that are that cover various industries of communication. I'll call it. You know, and, and with your inverse yeah. law that you just mentioned, it's very curious what you've said because it almost dovetails along with people today with the short, um, you know, instant gratification that we've, that we've become a society of. So. I'm just curious, yeah, you know, yeah, it, the radio it, it, side. It does. It, um, I I would tell you if you want to throw a throw a bomb into a room of radio folks of any stripe, ask them for the definition of radio. Oh yeah, that's great. Uh, I you know I think I think it you know it's you could you could ask the question and uh, you know and, and it's popular. So, oh well, you know you'll get the well it's not a radio if it doesn't have a dial and it doesn't have a tuner and an amplifier and you don't have some sort of an antenna or a reception capability the truth of the matter is from the standpoint of the people on the other end of the of the of the transmission by and large they don't care all they mm. care is i want to listen to x at this time and I don't really care what the transmission medium is. It doesn't matter to me. Um, and, and the younger they are, the more likely they are to see it that way. I th- certainly think my 14-year-old daughter sees it that way. Uh, so, you know, in a very practical question, if I'm driving down the road and I want to listen to WXYZ, do I care how that device in the dashboard is getting the signal to me? No. Mm, good, good, good point, yeah. I, I really don't. So, so the, the answer to what is radio in the end is, it it isn't what I would define as the physical device, uh, because arguably it's not. If it, you know, it, is it receiving electromagnetic waves? Well, okay, well that's probably not a radio from the way my generation saw it or your generation saw it. But from the standpoint of 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 the average person out there in the public now, they don't make a distinction. They don't make a distinction between Sirius XM and AM and FM and and uh, the and internet radio and you know and, and and none of that really makes any is any is any distinction to them because quite honestly, unless they are technically educated, they probably can't explain how a radio works to you anyway. I mean, hmm. sad to say. I mean, yeah, the average person won't wouldn't be able to tell you, well, this is an amplifier and this you know and and it has to feed the signal into into this and this this is a demodulator. I mean, none of that matters to them. Ah. Uh. You know, I, and so and so from that standpoint, they only see they see it as an appliance, and if that appliance delivers what they want, how it gets there from here doesn't matter. This huh. is true. You know, yeah. So, you know, we on the show, engineers, uh, our our colleagues in the industry, and uh, a number of people who participate in, in the chat room, and we meet at conventions. You know, all the people who I would consider my peers and and colleagues, we say radio, and we pretty well still think of a of a transmitter. Uh, and and wireless and wireless in the AM or FM or maybe the shortwave bands and you boy you you really drive the point home that that a lot of consumers today especially maybe those under some certain age um, boy they they don't care how it got there uh, like well uh, iTunes chose the name iTunes Radio. And it's not going over any AM or FM transmitter at all, and yet well, they're well, calling it radio. 
Well, okay, and let me turn that around for just a second here. Uh huh. Is is there not a radio and a receiver in there somewhere? Well, if you're on a, if you're using a a, a laptop, over a Wi-Fi or, 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 or a cellular signal, it's coming over a radio. It just yeah. isn't a radio yeah. like you and I know a radio with a. <laughs> it's dial not a radio on. that not a radio that I controlled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, and in fact, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to walk through the mall, and this is actually exercise. Yeah. You, if you want to, you got strange looks, but it, but it's an interesting exercise. Do it four or five times. Mm-hmm. Go up to people in the mall and ask them if they have a radio on their on them. Hmm. What 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 do you think they say? I'm guessing nine out of ten of them will tell you no, and then you can point out the cell phone in their pocket. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. And and yeah. and and so and so the again, it's a perceptual thing. You know, those of us who've been involved one way or another in in, in radio or television or broadcast for many years, we kind of know exactly what we're talking about. We, you know, we, un- we, we kind of, we, we kind of have a clear picture, um, but it, 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 that's not how, that's not how the public sees it. And I think, and I think ultimately industry discussions based on arguing about whether Sirius XM is radio or not are pointless because, because it's the consumer and the customer that's making the decision, not us. Well, it's been 84 yeah. years, you know, since that first broadcast from KDKA in 1929. 84 exactly. years of radio, generically, radio is a uh, medium to convey uh, information, whether it be uh, talk or music. So you're right. You know, it doesn't matter if it's XM Sirius or if it's AM or FM or it's a cell phone or whatever you want to call it. It's Wi-Fi enabled tabletop, uh, you know, device. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, you know, broadcasters themselves have to get, you know, get with the program. And unfortunately, they've gotten too far away from the program. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Folks, you are uh, listening or watching to This Week in Radio Tech. We may have to change the title someday uh, of, of what, what we talk about, what we do here. This is the show where we talk about ra- what we've always thought of as radio technology. I'm Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tobin and our guest Rob DeSantos. Uh, he is one of the writers uh, of the Trends and – well, he's the writer of the Trends and Technology column at Popular Communications Magazine. And uh, Rob has some really good, interesting insights on – on what is radio and and we're going to talk about where is radio going uh and we and he doesn't just know about uh, am and fm broadcast radio but also shortwave and uh, uh you know police scanner type of of communications we'll get into all that as the show goes on so welcome into the program which is brought to you by axia um so th- this subject i mean i'm trying to wrap my brain around this rob and and, and chris uh what is what is radio these days so if if i okay Fast forward about maybe another year or two years when any new car is going to have uh, 4G connectivity built in the dashboard. And, 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 you know, we've already got fancy color touchscreen displays on dashboards, have for some years, mostly used for navigation or controlling other mm, hardware audio devices uh, in, in the vehicle. So if you want to bring your iPod along for the ride, uh, there's often, you, you can get a dock for that. Um, I, I do in, in my car. I've got it in, in the glove box. Uh, in fact, I haven't had the iPod out of the glove box now in in months. Uh, it, it just lives there, and I you know play some favorite tunes there. Uh, also, I I'm doing a lot of Bluetooth in the car, so I'll have podcasts uh, or I'll be streaming live over 4G and and piping that via Bluetooth into into my car radio. Now, plenty of us geeks are doing that. I wouldn't say a whole huge, uh, a certain amount of majority of, of ordinary car drivers are doing that. But, you know, some people are. If you really want to listen to a program and, and that's how you're going to get it in, that's how you get it in. But when it becomes frictionless, when it becomes, you know, you pay your 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks a month to your uh, cell provider, uh, your wireless carrier, and you've got 4G in the car, and now instead of just the local 40 or 50 radio stations that you may have on your AM or FM tuner, now you've got... 20,000 stations to choose from and you know uh, maybe easily 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 favorites that that easily pop up in other words when it becomes frictionless to choose an a local FM station or an internet station maybe in your old hometown where you used to live just the place programming that you know you like what do we call that i'm sorry for the long preamble for the question but <laughs> rob what what do we call this thing in the in the dash now will we still call it a radio absolutely 
Chris well, says I yes. Think, I think I think that that the reality is that's where it's headed. I, I mean, I it's possible it changes. I mean, that the, the you know the rate at which these things seem to evolve is 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 uh, you know growing. I mean, it it's. Uh, I mean, I, I I've often wondered, you know, even some of the great inventors of our, you know, of of, of history, the the Edisons and people like that, would probably marvel at the changes just in the last fifteen or twenty years. Uh, but but yeah, it's a good question. I don't. I, I assume for the near future it'll be called radio. I just don't know of what what it will evolve into. Somebody at some point will come up with a great marketing term for it. I'm sure, uh, and that'll kind of be be for be forgotten. Uh, radio at per se will be forgotten. I you know, but I think I mean I think radio as we know it still has life in it. Uh, I mean I I think the the answer to that in part is that you know I. I I've written a series of columns, and, and, um, and I've, I've got a big feature article coming up in the next couple of months in the magazine on the proposed changes by the FCC to the AM band. But I wrote a column, oh, 15, 18 months ago, and it, and it was focused on what what's the future of AM radio. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. Uh, I got more feedback to that column than everything else I've written in the last five years combined. And it and what it told me was there are a lot of people out there who still really care, even people who are only peripherally interested in you know in in broadcast per se uh because because if you're over the age say of 40 you probably re- still remember a time when am really mattered uh i mean after all it was only i mean it was all about the time i graduated from high school when fm finally reached parity with am radio uh, mm, yeah, yeah. You know, and and so we, you know, while the while by some measures now AM share of the broadcast dollar is getting close to single digits, um, it's still it's still there, and and people still care, and you know, and and I think that you know there's a lot, you know, there's a you know a lot of a lot of question about whether whether. In another generation, AM will be part of it. And I talked about it a little bit on last week's program. And I think, I, I think, I think it really is a is a is a tough question to answer because the way I read what the FCC has proposed, it seems to me is we're we're changing the makeup and the and the dress, but we're not doing a whole lot about the shape of the body right now. <laughs> okay. And uh, right. you know, AM's not on the treadmill right now, and it's not a good thing. And yeah. and I and I think that. Unfortunately, the really hard decisions will end up probably being market driven and it's going to be brutal. I mean, I think, you know, I think if the current trends continue, there will come a point in the future where a large number of AM stations, particularly outside the major cities in this country, will no longer be financially viable. Yeah. Well, and, I think a lot know, of them and, aren't are not now. Yeah, and and I think and I think when that happens, what what's what's likely to take place is going to be going to going to be out of the control of the FCC or even the industry at that point because you know I radio station owners are businessmen like anybody else and at the point the business you're in is no longer profitable and you can't see any reason to continue it besides the goodness of your heart yeah. um, Fido needs dog food and you're going to do something <laughs> yeah. and, hey, and, I- and, I, and I and I think when that happens it's, it's not it, it might not be pretty which which is, which is the one thing that really does bother me is that as an in, as an industry, we need to have some really really hard discussions and 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 if we don't have them soon, the market will decide for us. Now, now Rob, you said something a minute ago where you you said uh, you said something like radio is still holding on, and you know I hear people say that, and I thought, well, okay, that's just whistling past the graveyard. But just earlier this month. Uh, on December 2nd, the, the annual radar report came out, a measurement of mm-hmm. radio listening across the U.S. Yep. I was surprised as could be by this. Um, radio, here, the headline uh, a few weeks ago was radio increases year-over-year reach by more than 700,000, according to the D- December 2013 radar report. It, mm-hmm. you know, we're, not li- we're not whistling past the graveyard yet. Here's, here's the breakdown here. Radio now reaches 241.8 million listeners, 91% of persons ages 12 and older on an average weekly basis, and the time spent listening has held steady at 2 hours and 35 minutes a day 
with the radio medium. And by the way, with the radar report, I I assume that they're talking about traditional broadcast radio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, I another, think, and I think that, that probably that that's, that's more or less right. It's what's happening really, it seems to me, is twofold. One is that the total number of hours to listen to audio is climbing much faster, and radio is not really sharing in that growth. The second thing is the share of AM out of that as opposed to FM is continues to shrink. And I guess the third point I would make is we have to be really wary of not of 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 thinking that um, because everything looks good today, there's no yeah. storm over the horizon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I think the I think the reality is. Do I think FM radio is going to go away? No, I, I think FM radio will be with us a long time, but I think its place will differ will change. And as you were talking about that thing of, you know, well, I could listen to my home my old hometown. I mean, I'm, yeah. I was a long-time resident of Southern California. I still sometimes like to tune into the radio stations in L.A. and see what's going on in my old town. Uh, I, I, people do that. And in that sense, yeah, it's still, it's still got, got life in it. I mean, a lot, there's still some stations making... Quite a bit of good money, as I'm sure, and it benefits the Telus Alliance and a lot of other companies because it's still still there. the 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 question really is not what happened last year. What's going to happen ten or fifteen years from now? And and I think that I think the answer to that is they'll still be sticks in the air, but I think their relative importance in the listening spectrum is going to kind of meld into all those other options because the 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 uh, the, the uh, example I would use is if if you're listening to if you're tuned into your favorite radio station and you're driving down the highway if that signal coming out of the speakers is coming to you over FM that's nice but you're, you went on your little graphical screen there and you punched up, you know, WXYZ and it came up and you're hearing it. Do you care whether that came over an internet connection, over a broadcast spectrum? Do you care if you're driving down the road and the radio, dis the radio device, whatever you call it, decides, I can't, I'm getting too weak a signal now, can't get that, that signal anymore, so I'm going to switch to the internet feed. And it switches transparently and you don't even know it happened. Which, which I, which, by the way, that's a technology that is in the laboratories right now. I would say to you, in that case, the the answer to 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 it is that, yeah, those broadcast hours that we're listening to might stay, continue to be there, but we might be measuring the wrong thing at that point. Yeah. 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 You know, I was looking at this radar report a bit more deeply. Uh, it turns out that uh, almost all of the gains in radio listening from December 2012 to December 2013, the, the 700,000 additional weekly listeners that the radar report claims, um, those were almost all Hispanic listeners. Turns out that Hispanic listeners, especially young and middle-aged, have grown incredibly and so that tells me that the number of non-Hispanic listeners, and the report doesn't say this, but I, I, if you do the math, unless I'm missing something, that, that's what it's going to be. The number of non-Hispanic listeners has remained about flat. And that's what I guess that's what you would expect. At least we haven't lost a whole lot. Uh, maybe yeah, lost no, a tiny and, little and, bit. And I think, and I think there, there's a perfect example. It reflects the demographic trends in society. Uh -huh. you know, I mean, that's, that's one of those look at the census numbers and it tell you, tell you what's happening. And I think, you know, it, it would be... 15 or 20 years ago, outside of a few places along the southern border of the United States and maybe out on the west, most major markets, most markets in this country didn't even have a Spanish language station. Now I tell you, there's probably right. not a major market in the United States that doesn't have at least one. Yeah. Some of them have three or four or five, um, even in moderate sized communities. And it, it, but that's a demographic trend. I think I think the interesting part, by the way, about that is 
not all those Hispanic stations are broadcasting in Spanish. Some mm -hmm. of them are you doing bilingual programming? Because you're seeing that in television now, there are Hispanic networks going on the air, and the predominant language is English. And you're thinking, so why would they do that? Well, the answer actually is, you're seeing the same thing happen in the Hispanic community in the second, third, and fourth generation as happened in other immigrant communities. Happened in my, I'm an, an Italian ancestry. It happened in my family 100 years ago. This year, my grandfather came over on a boat from Italy. He spoke Italian. He eventually learned English. My grandmother never did. Um, my father never had a discussion with him that was in English. <laughs> um, my daughter, who's the, now the, you know, the, thir the third generation after them, uh, has absolutely no interest in learning Italian. Yeah, she doesn't yeah. see any point in it. Um, she's never heard it spoken at home. So, you know, assimilation happens. Uh, but but yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that that the growth ha that's where the growth is. But I think that's a demographic growth. I don't think it's a technology driven growth. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, um, it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. It's a uh, it's gonna be a, a, I think the next next few years, you know, could be a a slow ride downhill, and yet. I believe that I certainly believe that people want content. They want to be informed. I mean, look at audiobooks. Audiobooks have have grown and grown and grown. Audible.com, for example, uh, that that has grown and grown. People still, you know, people still devour uh, programming from, say, NPR, which produces a lot of news and talk programming, and then uh, all kinds of other services that are online, like iHeartRadio, and and then uh, consolidators like Stitcher or or, or TuneIn. Um, you know, these guys are appear to be doing okay. And then there's Pandora. Uh, you know, provider of, of a lot of this. So people want to consume content. Um, uh, you know, hopefully people don't forget about radio, what we call radio, or that radio makes sure that they're inserted into these other places. If radio is producing content, it ought to be available, you know, how people want to want to get it. Well, I think, I think that's exactly it. If you're, if, you're producing, if you're producing good content, if you're producing a product that people want to listen to it, and you make yourself available where they want it, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna consume it. I mean, it, it's there's no, there's no shortage of desire for good entertainment or good education or good whatever you might just because because it's there, and uh, I mean, uh, it, it's it's absolutely absolutely uh, you know in demand. Uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of Stitcher, for example. I mean, I I uh, uh, you know Stitcher is great. I can queue up a whole bunch of whole bunch of podcasts and. And I can be on car for two hours and listen to just all kinds of stuff and never, never have to, you know, have to think about it. It's it's all it's all right there. Um, I think I think there I think all of those services have their place, and and I and I don't think broadcast is going away. I, I but I do think for the AM stations there there is a real question of survival here, and yeah, and it yeah. and and it's and there's a you know. Well, you could do you could do five programs on, on what's going on there, but I, but I think, but I think that's a that's that's a um, a real emotional issue right now, and it, and it deserves to be because it, it because it it's it's uh, the AM band. Unfortunately, I think from a regulatory standpoint, was even by the FCC's own admission, was largely ignored for decades, um, and and I think they've ignored it to the point where. Where now, as I said, you can change the dress, but you're not really doing anything about the body. Because um, if you have to do something about the body, it's going to be really painful. Um, you know, there are there are ways you can there are ways you can make the keep the people who own those businesses in viable business. But whether you can do that and preserve the band as we've historically known it is is problematic. Um, but there's you know. There, there's growth in other areas. I, I think you know what you're seeing in low power FM, uh, and the, and the you know the thousands and thousands of groups that want to get on the air with these local low power stations all across the country. Um, you know, is it the the number of applications filed was was in the thousands, and and I think I think that just reflects that you know give people an opportunity to get their message out and they'll show up, as well as the listeners. So, yep. you know, it's, yeah. it's there. 
Yeah, broad, hey, uh, broadcasts I wanna, I wanna, have to I wanna change ask, their thinking. Yeah, I want to ask Chris uh, Tobin a, a couple of things here. Chris, I, I, I would always, I always imagine that you being a, a New Yorker, um, you, you got to live in a bit of a bubble regarding the viability of AM radio stations. You've got some fantastic AM stations there, and what twenty million people in the area to listen to them. Uh, probably more than that if we start including uh, you know areas farther out that the AMs still get to. Um, uh, uh, what? Well, I guess Chris, what kind of bubble do you think you're in compared to like I got an AM station in Greenville, Mississippi, and it, it's not viable. I mean, it's it's only on the air because uh, our FMs you know, are able to pay its bills. Well, I you know the, it, larger markets. Yeah, I guess you could say there are bubbles. There are a lot of broadcasters in this market uh, in the New York City, Connecticut, New Jersey market that are doing very well. They're smaller stations, and they're both AM and FM. I think part of the problem we're running into as an industry and the, the the way we think about things is, you know, as we were talking earlier with the, the word radio, what is radio? And and Rob's point is it doesn't matter how people get their, their uh, content. And content is, yes, definitely drives everything. I mean, look at the latest uh, article from CBS Inc. They're, they've shifted their revenue uh, sources farther away from advertising only to now more content-driven licensing and uh, rebroadcast. Okay, that's CBS. ABC's mm -hmm. been doing that. D ABC Disney is the same thing, and a few others. But they're beholden to Wall Street when it comes to stockholder value, so their decisions sometimes are you know, biased. Then you have broadcasters who could do better, but because they're publicly traded, they're at the mercy of a lot of business analysts who claim to know what they're talking about in, the, in our in our industry. So, in the case of being in a bubble, New York City. I think the only bubble is the, the larger broadcast groups. Those are the ones that have a bubble. They're afraid to do something. I've worked for several of them, and I've had to sit in meetings and listen to the phrase, well, we'd love to do that, but that would break the radio station. Reality is it wouldn't have. And I worked for a couple of stations that did some pioneering with internet delivery of content, not, not rebroadcasting the on-air signal, but actually creating content that was driven by um, topics of the day or, or events of the day. And everybody over the age of 45 in the company, in the executive staff, couldn't see how this made any sense and abandoned all of our stuff. That was five years ago. Five years later, I'm now seeing the same type of content delivery, content creation, being done by non-broadcast entities, Stitcher, Pandora, and others. So I, I think bubbles do exist. I think a lot of them have to do with basically companies who are set in their ways because they're afraid to make a change. I can't speak for what you have, Kirk, in your situation, but I've met a lot of folks who are in, you know, we'll just say small markets, medium markets, whatever, who have been fighting hard to try and keep what they want. And they've learned by just changing the way their content goes and their attitude, and they've been able to turn things around. Not everybody can. Mm -hmm. But it, I, I'm still a firm believer, and as Rob pointed out, the content delivers, okay? However, you have to, like any product, we'll just say, you know, I have this bottle of, uh, you know, bottle of water from Poland Springs, by itself, it will go nowhere fast. But if you market, create a, a buzz about it, and do other things, it suddenly becomes something people want. It's bottled water. There's, what, 12 different brands out there you can get the, the same thing. At, at each gas station, yeah. At each gas station. But yet people still will have a certain favorite. Radio has lost that. If you go back in the history, and as Popcom used to do back in the day, and it probably still does now from time to time, you look at the history of the popular Famous radio stations. And we lost a jock this week. Larry Lujak passed away. Larry Lujak in yeah. Chicago worked for WLS, right? I mean, you're talking, you know, big time AM stations. I'll just say that. And why were they successful? Because they were an AM? Because there was no one in the competition? No. Because they delivered content people wanted to participate in. They were the original, the original social media uh, uh, outlets. Think about it. Go back into the air checks, listen to some of the stuff. Uh, CKLW, okay? 2020 news you look listen to some of that stuff listen to some of the things they did on that radio station by today's standards they'd be taken up on charges and be in court right now <laughs> i kid you not you know there's oh, a I famous you're, 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 you're absolutely right right i mean come on a tisket a tasket they went home in a basket two youths up, today were a, yeah. that's that's a famous line from cklw 2020 news byron mcgregor you know tisket a tasket they you know two youths go home in a basket or, or a uh, a lady's wielding a twenty ounce Louisville slugger took it to the head of her husband, who decided he wasn't happy with the way she did dinner. These are actual broadcast news elements that I'm repeating. 
from an anniversary ad check that you can get for CKLW. Could you imagine somebody doing that today? No. But it, we don't even touch, scratch the surface today in programming. Instead, we're all up on this, you know, let's do this, let's aggregate this, let's do this, let's, let's move it to this, and we'll change its name, and we'll do this, recreate, as Rob points out, the, underneath the package is still the wrong stuff, but we just put a new label on it. It doesn't mean anything. So, you know, I'm, yeah, there's plenty of bubbles all around the major markets, but I think <laughs> that the real trick is broadcasters have to just get up and get back to basic business. I mean, real business, not the business of giving business. <laughs> I'm serious. Hey. I'm, I'm serious. I mean, you you read some of the trades. I mean, you know, some of the trade magazines and the things they say and why you know companies are cutting staff. Like you know, the classic line now, the big thing at the year end is we have to cut staff because you know uh, the market's not pacing you know where we want it to be. Really, according to the things I've read, the market that you're talking about is doing very well. You've chosen not to do anything about it. So instead, you got rid of half your sales staff, or you got rid of the morning show producers, and all of a sudden, now your morning show is no longer creative. They're just regurgitating something they wrote an hour early. How many morning shows you, you listen to nowadays, syndicated included, where the first hour is live, second hour is a tape, third hour is maybe half live, half tape of the hour of the first? Yeah. 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 Tell me they're not doing that, because I've worked on them. I, yeah. That doesn't work. It only gets you to a certain, as you point out, you know, with the radar report, it plateaus. You know, the demographic shifting to Hispanic or, you know, whether it's Hispanic, Indian, or Asian, doesn't matter. It's the content they want. If they want to assimilate to society, they're going to go with, you know, the content that, that the assimilation process they want to be part of. I mean, you know, I, I come from a background of, of multinational family. We I grew up in a, in a city where back in the day, as Rob pointed out, a lot of folks spoke, you know, it was Italian, German. You had, uh, you know, various other languages, you know, Spanish. And then over the years, things change and shift, and you go with it. And now we're seeing that happen all over again. It's just, it just repeats itself. But now, broadcasters are not responding to this. Instead, we're screaming at people like Pandora. You're taking my business away. Really? 50% of Pandora's staff came from radio. So, hello. Why'd they come from radio? Oh, that's right, because they were let go from the broadcast uh, jobs. Think, you know, think of it in terms of business. You know, you have an asset. You you want to cut expenses. I mean, I'm sorry. You want to increase profit. What was the big, the big thing, the big trick, the you know, the real genius business move for the last ten years? Cut expenses. But if you if you're a real businessman, you say in order to be profitable, you have to increase sales, increase you know revenue coming in. How do you do that? You rethink, you reinvent. No, broadcasters, we just cut staff. <clears throat> so we cut the salaries. And the bottom line looks better because at the end of the year, we can say, oh, we saved 20% in salaries. So the, our bottom line went up. Therefore, our market value is better and stockholder and everyone's happy. No, the reality <laughs> is you didn't move. You, you didn't yeah, move anything. Yeah. But that's been accepted. Now we're, hey, you know, uh, now we're paying for it. Uh, you, are, you are watching and listening to This Week in Radio Tech. And uh, I'm Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tobin and Rob DeSantos from Popular Communications Magazine. Coming up, Rob's going to talk a bit about the sun cycle that we're in. What does that have to do with broadcasting? Well, more than I thought. So stick around. Uh, saving AM and uh, and what will what will happen to AM if it's not if it's not saved? Well, we'll have some thoughts on that coming up with uh, with Rob DeSantos. Our show is brought to you by my friends and colleagues at Axia, and I want to show you. This is so great. It's like show and tell. I want to show you some pictures of a studio that is under construction right now, right as we're doing this show. There are engineers there toiling away and. Look at that. That is so pretty. Look at the lighting overhead and look at, well, if you can see, if, if you're not, if you're listening to the show, I'm sorry, you're missing. Look at the legs <laughs> on that table. Isn't that amazing? They're guitar necks. Look at that. And, and from the ceiling, um, highlighted lights coming down, uh, white and purple. There's the, there's your modern day studio with a whole bunch of video monitors and your audio console. Now this is not ready to go. It's under construction. There's a, there's an HD, a pan tilt zoom HD TV camera over on the wall. That ought to tell you something about what they're going to be doing in there. And there's a there's all those monitors, racks full of equipment, although not nearly as much equipment I think as we used to have. Uh, just a few punch blocks. Those are for GPIOs. So there's no audio flowing through those punch blocks. Uh, this place is a is a whole a whole Axia installation. Big, big honking Axia board with telephone control in there. Uh, they're adding this studio to an existing Telos VX system uh let's see what else we have there well there, there's the manuals laying out uh is, is that a vox pro controller there gentlemen is that what that uh, is with the shuttle wheel yes it? it is that's vox pro okay yeah Vo uh, hardware vox pro controller 
um, <laughs> part, parts of guitar necks for, uh, uh, for support. This is the, uh, this is the other, this is where the producer sits and the producer will have a, uh, console of his own. And look at that. It's a, it's an Axia radius, the same console or the same kind of console that this very show is coming to you through right now. Um, it's a whole Axia installation there and more engineers working on it. A few wires here and there. There's a, a Telos V set 12 that's uh, getting ready to uh, handle a bunch of phone calls. There's going to be a nationally syndicated show coming out of this studio in uh, in just a few weeks. Well, I want to show you that. An Axia studio under construction. I Folks, I built a lot of studios, and I've done it the hard way for years and years, as, as Chris Tobin has done. Chris, have you built a studio the hard way? Uh-oh. I'm yeah? sorry. The hard oh, way? Said, yes. Chris, have, have you built a studio the hard way? Well, yeah. That's what, That was state of the art at the time. Now the state of the art yeah, art's shifted. Maybe you've taken out. You've probably never put in a Christmas tree, but you've probably taken a few out. I know I did uh, early on in my career. I was uh, putting in Christmas trees, learning how they solder and, and wire wrap around them. Oh my God, you're older than I thought. Uh, well, I was just happened to work in facilities that were very um, dated and traditional, and <laughs> oh, kept to okay. kept to certain things. But yeah, Christmas well, trees, and yeah, I put I put them in. I've taken them out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad you're taking them out. Well, hey, uh, Andrew, if you could go back and show one of the shots of some wires hanging out somewhere uh, from from that selection, I don't know if you still got them there available. But uh, in an, when you build an Axia studio, you're building a studio using live wire, which is uh, Ethernet. It's it's IP. Uh, it uses uh, off-the-shelf Cisco switches, and you get to hook various devices up instead of a slew of cables. With most devices, just one cable will hook it up to the rest of the system. So um, oh, this one cable carries live wire audio, which is linear. It's linear IP audio. It's not compressed. Uh, it's bit for bit. What goes in comes out. Um, it also carries GPIO, that is contact closures, you know, to control something. Uh, in, in, a, in a studio uh, just down the hall from this one that you're looking at, they run a national show there uh, every day. Uh, with national talent, big time, I'm telling you. And uh, they wanted to add a profanity delay. So they purchased a, uh, uh, a 25-7 brand uh, profanity delay, which has a live wire jack on the back. And instead of having to wire a bunch of GPIOs and contact closures and, and buttons around the place, put one wire in the back, one cable, one Ethernet cable goes to the Cisco switch, and then a little typing... And it all got configured, and so audio goes in, audio comes out. Of course, when it goes in delay, audio goes in, it comes back out like seven seconds later. And all the tally lights, all the control for, uh, remotely from the console or from the producer's uh, station, um, it, it all happens over that, that Ethernet. It's really easy to do. And it also means that if they need to swap it out or change something, that's easy too. So uh, this is all done with live wire and Axia. You saw some Telos uh, telephones there, some Telos V-sets like, like the one on the – there we go. The one on the screen behind me. Uh, these are all audio over IP and just so easy to wire up. If you've not had the pleasure of building an Axia studio, hey, before your career's over in radio, whether that's five years from now or 50 years from now, you need to experience it. I've built a number of uh, Axia studios myself, and it's really gratifying for something to go together that fast. And when you're done, it works so beautifully. And you know what? Can even be configured and changed, and and uh, uh, you know if you need to make configuration changes, can even be done remotely. Um, when they need me to, once in a while, I remotely log into my radio station in Pongo Pongo American Samoa, and uh, you know make a change. Maybe they want the mic to have some more bass, uh, or maybe they need to bring the newsroom into a different fader. Easy to do remotely. Check it out on the web. Uh, axiaaudio.com. A x i a axiaaudio.com. And uh, check it out there. Really appreciate it if you do. And uh, Livewire, promise you, it'll make your life a whole lot simpler. You're watching This Week in Radio Tech, our episode number 195 with me, Kirk Harnack, along with Chris Tobin in studio in Queens, New York, and Rob DeSantos from Columbus, Ohio. All right, Rob, back at the show here. Um, you and I were talking uh, a couple hours ago about sun cycle, uh, sun, sun activity. And I know that has something to do with shortwave and ham radio communications, what does that have to do with the broadcast communications and, and what's happening right now with that? Uh oh, did Rob leave? Oh, you said something to offend him, or the topic you, <laughs> you just broached on was something he can't speak about. No, I think uh, actually, that you know, that sunspot activity, as it's known as, uh, also impacts utility lines, too. Really? Oh, yeah. The, uh, the corona discharge from the sun. 
Oh, there's yeah. all kinds of articles of of things of that sort. It's uh, it's pretty wild. And yeah, communications in in, in general, and uh, that's what the Tempest rating is for a lot of satellites that are in orbit to, to handle those. Uh, what they call that? that magnetic flux is a, oh. like a plasma oh, so that comes off the uh, sun. This thing called a Tempest rating is that a measure of quality of how well a, a satellite, which is outside of our magnetic uh, belts, you know, that protect us from from such things. Uh, those are the tempest rating is a measure of quality. Well, the tempest uh, rating is actually uh, tempest design is based on how to harden a device from radio uh, ra from radiation, uh, from gamma oh, rays, uh -huh. X rays of that sort. Um, and satellites are designed in that fashion. Why you, that's why you see gold foil on them. Uh, there's a lot of things uh -huh. they do to to harden the, the device so it can withstand it. But the sunspot activity, a sun cycle, there is a name for that. Uh, the solar storms. Oh yeah, yeah. Do okay. do wreak havoc, um, and they have different intensities and the cycles. Was it every eleven years? I think I forget how it works. Uh, but there are some articles I've read. It's just wild how uh, you can have power outages and disruption in power distribution because of it. Uh, a lot of times you you know you don't know when or how, but that's that's the kind of stuff. I'm sure Rob um, could elaborate even more on it. I think we have him back. Yep. Oh okay. Yep. Okay. Scott hey Rob, welcome back. Yeah, welcome back. That was all of a sudden we weren't there. Uh, Skype was uh, fails when you when you when you need it the most. Well, no, that was so, actually the NSA tapping in because of the topic we're about to talk about. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, t tell us about this this the solar cycle uh, and what's this doing for broadcasters or against broadcasters? Well, well, one of the things that's one of the things that's part of the dialogue on the on the whole AM issue is relates to the fact that AM propagation is different during the day than at night. Mm -hmm. During the day, it's ground wave propagation. At night, it's more like shortwave. It's skywave propagation. That signals can reflect off the ionosphere and go out huge distances, which in the concept of the 1920s and 30s, you know, the clear channel stations at clear frequencies, you know, could reach 30, 40 states at night. Well, the thing is that as that's broken down over the years, and we have all these other stations on the frequencies, and they're all, they're all broadcasting extended hours, perhaps at reduced power, some of that signal is leaking out. It's noise. Well, what's going on with the sun right now? Well, we're in the middle of supposedly a peak of the solar cycle. When you'd expect propagation to be at its best. But okay. this solar maximum is the weakest solar maximum in, a, in more than a century. Um, some speculation may, is that it might be one of the weakest ever recorded. Hasn't gone to zero, but it's it's you know we're we're at levels that that were would have been considered very low at the at the uh, minimum twenty twenty two years ago. Hmm. So when we talk about what's happening at night and propagation, we're not in we're not in what we're used to have been used to for most of the ninety years we've had AM radio in this country. Uh, you know it's it's uh, normally at this part of the solar cycle. You would be getting people who are who try to li do DXing, listening to long distance radio stations at night. AM DXers would tell you that at this point they ought to be hearing, you know, stations from halfway around the world on those oddball nine kilohertz split frequencies that are yeah. used in most of the rest of the world. Yeah. And 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 the, and the reception at this right now is 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 terrible. You know, there's they're not getting the numbers they're used to. They're still there occasionally. I mean, geez, they're stationed on, I think, 15, 21 kilohertz in Saudi Arabia that uses half a million watts. Yeah, they still get out at night. <laughs> so, so, okay, let me make sure I understand here. Our, our solar, what should be, um, we should be coming into a maximum where there's a lot of solar activity, and our maximum is not very high at all. In fact, it's about as high as some other solar minima have been. Yeah. And so we're not getting the increase in propagation uh, that that we're accustomed to getting every what about eleven years or so. Yeah, exa exactly. And and okay. And and there's a lot of arguments and go on between the in, in terms of the science behind what's actually happening with the sun. The problem the problem from a planning standpoint is it's simply making what's going on right now worse. In the sense that whatever whatever we think's going on now is probably not a real reading of what we've gone on has gone on historically uh over the 90 years or so we've had radio um mm -hmm. 
as we know it. And, and so, and so, yeah, it's, 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 it, it adds just another layer of complexity. And oh, by the way, the climate scientists will argue about whether the sun's affecting global warming or not. That's another whole, whole, whole discussion, but unrelated to this, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, these are all factors in it because the, because even a signal, you know, you got a, you got a, you got a, 1000 watt nighttime signal that signal doesn't disappear at the end of the fcc contour it might not be listenable but a but a tiny bit of that's still still out there it gets weaker with sure. distance but it's still out there and 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 you pile enough of those on top of one another and that throw in some digital hash from the you know from the from the handful of stations doing you know doing uh you know the ubiquity digital thing at night and boy you have a real mess mm, yeah yeah got a lot of a lot of noise out there absolutely and that yeah yeah so so um what do we expect over the next few years as far as this solar maxima are we just gonna uh, go back down into a solar minima uh, yeah i mean we came off we came okay. off an extremely deep and long minima and ah. and we're probably going to another one but but beyond that, I have absolutely no idea, and I don't think anybody else does either. Is this not a matter of the skies falling and the sun's burning out, is it? No, no, no. I mean, it, okay. it, it's the, the, the problem we have with predicting solar activity is that, that while we can get some idea of the general levels of solar activity from tree rings and ice cores and all that sort of stuff, mm. in terms of observing the sun and knowing what we – and getting data and knowing what's happening on the sun, we only have – arguably 150 to 300 years of data the sun is five billion years old yeah, yeah. We're, we're, our sample size is a little small at this point <laughs> oh uh so let's um you know we, we we could touch on on am radio some more but tell you what i'd like to do i'd like to to move over we have plenty of, of uh, uh ham radio guys uh uh, who watch and listen to the show talks about what's going on in in the world of other communications besides broadcasts before we have to have to uh, close the show down. What's happening in shortwave and and ham radio? Well, the situation in shortwave is is um, makes AM look healthy. Um, international broadcasting as it exi has it existed from the 1930s until the last oh, 10 or 15 years is essentially dying. Um, hmm. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that the political imperative that drove the need for large international broadcasters during the Cold War is gone. Uh, and the second thing is the internet. It, yeah. It's made it possible to hear those stations around the world, which prior to the early 1990s, the only way you could do it was by shortwave. Yeah. And the general complexity of the marketplace is such that there are so many entertainment options and so many avenues to get radio in most developed parts of the world, shortwave's irrelevant. The places it still matters are some parts of Asia and Africa where the infrastructure is not there yet. And we're getting news, particularly in certain government-regulated societies, is still hard. So getting outside mm. news is important. So okay. there's still a role for the Voice of America uh, and BBC's international arm and a few of those people, but but even that has shrunk. Uh, you know, VOA once had four major broadcasting uh, centers in the United States. I mean, broadcast. I didn't talk about transmitting locations here. Yeah, yeah. they're down to basically borrowing one that they sold and are leasing back. Oh, oh goodness. Um, and they lease a bunch of avenues overseas and stuff like that uh the bbc is in roughly getting close to the same situation um and and so there's the the, the uh it's got you know it, it's not healthy um what's going on in in uh in say more more near term more close in transmissions like the you know the the uh, utility bands and police and fire and radio um, digital, that's what's happening there. Um, there's a mass movement going on in, among police and fire and utility users to move to digital. 
Uh, so you see less and less, you, know, you see that happening. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're unlistenable. It oh, mean that's my question. Yeah. Okay. The, the radios to listen to them have, have gotten three times as expensive as they used to be. You know, you're not going to go into your local radio shack and buy a $40 scanner anymore and do it because in many parts of the country, you're not going to hear much more than the, uh, uh, than the plumber yeah. using his, you know, his, 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 uh, radio in his truck. It just isn't, it, it isn't, it's ha not happening. Uh, but it's, you know, a lot of them are still unscrambled, but there's, but they're now digital. Um, and, the, and you're seeing gradually, slowly seeing all these uh, public service agencies integrating their communication systems. It's happening faster in some areas than others. Um, and I, ironically, probably happening more effectively outside the four or five largest uh, metropolitan areas in the country because integrating the police and fire agencies in, in, say, the New York City metro area is orders of magnitude more complex than doing it in um, Akron, Ohio. That's true. That's very true. Mm. And, and, mm. and, and uh, the other problem they're facing, though, is spectrum. The demands on spectrum, because uh, after all, that's a finite resource, and only so much nature gives us, is is really really severe. And and the uh, you know everybody wants a piece of of seven hundred megahertz or nine hundred megahertz communication bands, whether it's for cellular or um, or or the local you know the local uh, police department or. Or, you know, a new TV service or whatever it is, mobile TV. There's a, that would be a discuss, another good discussion. Um, you know, I, so, so they've got some real issues there. Mobile, uh, the whole, that, whole, uh, that whole area is, uh, is, is, uh, is pretty intense. I mean, some of, those, some of those public service frequencies are worth tens of millions of dollars a megahertz. Hmm. Um, hmm. But obviously you want your fire department to have it if, you, if it's your house that's on fire. So <laughs> good point. It's, it, you know, a lot going on there. Are, are, if, if there's such a demand on public service frequencies, why is there so much more demand today than there was? Uh, I don't know, say 20, 25 years ago, when most of it was analog. A few trunking systems uh, were, were 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 coming in, into play, which I I guess was still analog, just move, moving about in frequency. What, what? Why all the all the extra demand? Are are more people talking to each other? Companies want to make money. Um. I think, I, I, Chris, I, I think what's happened is that if you looked, if you looked at say frequencies above the the, the FM band up through 900 megahertz to gigahertz 30 years ago, you had police and fire, some local services and utilities, the you know the the dog catcher, the plumber, people like that who had business radio services. Uh, you had television. Uh, using the the, the tra you know the traditional um, you know dozen or so you know local broadcast channels and not a whole lot else. Um, I mean, there are both some military up there and a few you know and and some and that sort of thing. But but by and large, there wasn't anybody else up there. Now, the demand for frequencies for cell service for w wide area Wi-Fi that's coming very quickly uh, hmm. you know for all those you know and for the and you know and for all those other services where they want to send you a monthly bill so yeah I think I think that I think that's what's happened it, it, the frequencies you know the other thing is technology I mean a 900 megahertz radio was pretty unwieldy 30 years ago now you carry one in your pocket and you complain uh, that if it weighs more than four ounces yeah yeah um uh, Rob, I told you the hour would fly by, and it has. We've gone over an hour. And if if folks want to hear more of what you have to say and what other uh, other thought leaders and in industry leaders to say about communications nowadays, tell us about the magazine, Popular Communications. Popular Communications is uh, is is probably in uh, in, in about every uh, major news newspaper uh, magazine rack you'll find in the country. Uh, you know, to your local Barnes and Noble, for example, will have it in pretty much any mm -hmm. place. And if they don't carry it. You Go ask them for it because they can get it very easily, um, you know. And and uh, you know, get an issue. It's also available uh, digitally through Zinio. So if you prefer to read your magazines on your uh, Kindle, you can do that. Hmm. Um, 
you can, uh, you know, their popular communications is, you know, is on, you know, is on the, uh, on Facebook, uh, you can go there and talk to it, you know, ask questions. Uh, uh, some of us authors actually pop up there once in a while. Um, you know, and of course, uh, you know, all of us are, are reachable by one electronic media, media electronic medium or another. Um, uh, and, uh, and there are, there are still, there are one or two, uh, good, uh, good radio conventions still around that aren't, uh, aren't just radio industry, uh, uh, coming up in March, uh, is the, uh, it's still called the shortwave listeners fest. Um, it's in Phil in the Philadelphia area every year, but it covers a whole lot more than shortwave these days. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, people from all over the world show up and they love to talk about radio. I noticed that uh, Popular Communications Magazine has a, um, a Facebook page, so that's a good way to connect and, and at least get introduced to uh, the magazine and the ideas that are uh, uh, being batted around there. Uh, go to Facebook and just uh, search for a Popular Communications Magazine. I would imagine uh, that, uh, Rob, you, you probably participate in this page from time to time and uh, get uh, get articles or links to articles posted there. A lot of pictures there, a lot of things going on, so uh, yeah, check that out. Sure, and, sure. and on your newsstand, you'll, you'll find Popular Communications on your newsstand, right? Yes, absolutely. All right, good deal. Hey, we got to go. Our show has been brought to you by my friends at Axia, and we showed you pictures of a studio under construction. When, when I can, we'll bring you pictures of that studio finished and maybe a little video of it in operation. It's a really cool place. Thanks, Axia Audio, at the, on the web at axiaaudio.com for uh, supporting and sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Chris Tobin in studio in Queens, New York. Thanks for being with us, buddy. Appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Hey, a word, just a word to the audience. This week, Bernie Weiss passed away. He was the uh, founder of Energionics CCA, and also the father of grounded grid transmitters for FM. Those of you who are transmitter nuts, you know what I mean. And thank you so much for reminding us. And I got to tell you, uh, Bernie and I were friends. I, I used to, I did, I did a lot of, uh, did a lot of warranty work for him uh, for on his Energionics line and grounded grid. Oh my gosh! I got to tell you, that's just my favorite design. That is the best. A grounded grid tr uh, FM transmitter. Open the back door. What do you got? A transformer, a diode, a capacitor, a choke, and a tube. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you have and an you have an arc welder when you want to do some work. <laughs> you have an arc welder if you want that. That's right. <laughs> grounded grid. What a fabulous, simple, and effective design. Just seems to be, generally speaking, free of so many problems that that plague other or plagued other high power uh, tube transmitters and you know we don't have any tube transmitters around anymore and bernie wise was so often at the do you know wasn't he the first guy to come up with a usable ip audio studio transmitter link for use over the, the internet yes. yes it was two pcs yeah i get that but he was the first yeah. i mean what a great thinker just awesome bernie wise uh, passed away at the age of 87 years old actually just about a week ago thanks for that reminder chris you're welcome all right. Uh, we'll catch you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Our uh, show next week will be at this regular time, uh, Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. But uh, starting in 2014, we'll be on earlier. We'll be on the, in the middle of the afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, on Thursdays with a repeat of the show about the same time in the evening. So if you're used to catching it uh, at this time, you certainly can. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye. That's all the bandwidth we can pill for this week. Another tort has propagated, and all the transmitters and audio equipment live happily ever after, thanks to the handsome engineer and his kind, benevolent care. We'll be back next week. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. This week in Radio Tech. Subscribe to iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Search for This Week in Radio Tech in the iTunes Store. Soliciting is strictly encouraged. If you like today's show, tell a friend. If you didn't like it, we were never here. Kirk Harnack's wardrobe provided by the Salvation Army and the Red Cross Disaster Relief Services. Hair and makeup provided by Penny Lope Garcia Hernandez Weinberg. He's unique, wouldn't you say? I just want to get it over with. This ends this transmission. Tango, Whiskey, India, Romeo, Tango. Signing off. Okay. <laughs>